Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadee Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program where we're studying chapter 15 in this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. This chapter 15 is titled True Love, Love Without Attachment. This is such an important topic as it relates to the path to enlightenment because as long as we have craving, desire, attachment in our relationships, we're going to be sabotaging them. We're going to be crushing them and it makes it very difficult to have wholesome relationships or successful relationships, fulfilling relationships when we're sabotaging and crushing our relationships. Oftentimes I hear in some parts of the Buddhist world that people think that you can't have love and actually attain enlightenment, which is 100% false. There's nothing but love as part of this path to enlightenment. But oftentimes we mistakenly describe craving, desire, attachment as love. The unenlightened mind is misunderstanding craving, desire, attachment as love. And as long as we misunderstand what love is, then we're going to be sabotaging and crushing our relationships. So what we're going to be doing in today's class is describing what true love is to understand how to love without attachment. Because when we love without attachment, this is unconditional love. And when we can have unconditional love in our relationships, the love can actually be permanent. But as long as we are misunderstanding craving, desire, attachment as love, then this is what someone might call conditional love. This is what's going to sabotage the relationships, and that is not permanent. That's why we have struggled in relationships one after another after another, whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, life partner, our children, our boss, our coworkers, our friends, our family, our neighbors. If you've been having challenges in relationships throughout your life, it's probably because you're having craving, desire, attachment in your relationships and they're being sabotaged, they're being smothered, they're being crushed. And it's not until you learn what true love is and you practice love without attachment that you'll be able to have fulfilling, long lasting and successful relationships with everyone around you. So I'm very pleased that you guys all decided to join today because this is such an important topic for us, particularly as household practitioners, because we have so many relationships involved in our life. We oftentimes have life partners, we have children, we have bosses, we have coworkers, we have lots of friends, we have neighbors, we have different people around us that we interact with on an ongoing basis. And when we understand how to love without attachment, we can have very rewarding and very successful relationships. So you learning this is very important and very vital to your path to enlightenment because ultimately, if we're practicing this eightfold path that I've shared in the past, which is the path to enlightenment, and we're learning things like right view, but mainly right intention, right speech, right action, and all the others, well, as long as we have craving, desire, attachment in our relationships, it makes it very difficult to have right intention, right speech, and right actions. When we find that we have craving, desire, attachment in our relationships, the mind can arise frustration and anger very quickly and very easily. And then we really struggle to have something like right speech. And then we end up damaging the relationship due to our anger arising in the mind. Where when we learn how to love without attachment and our relationships don't have this craving, desire, attachment, then it becomes so easy and effortless to practice something like right speech in our relationships 
because oftentimes the people that are closest to us those are the ones that we end up hurting the most with our intention speech and actions because they're the ones that are closest to the fire so to speak so when we put out that fire of craving desire attachment and we love without attachment now we can speak in ways that are very loving and very kind through all people and we don't cause harm in the relationships around us and that's why we can have these very fulfilling relationships so i'm going to explain to you guys today what true love is but before we do that we're going to actually just kind of remind you about something related to the four noble truths because in order to understand the teaching of true love i need to just remind you of the second noble truth and the third noble truth of course all four noble truths are very important and those are needed in order for us to attain enlightenment but in terms of what we're going to be discussing today around true love i would like to just remind you guys of the second and third noble truth and if somebody is joining us today that hasn't been part of these classes if this is the first class that you've been in with me you may not have been exposed to the way that I teach the Four Noble Truths. So this can be a good introduction for you. And we'll kind of cast this around relationships. So the goal of this path to enlightenment is to eliminate discontentedness. That's the whole goal, is to eliminate conditioned feelings such as sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy, and all these other discontent feelings that the mind struggles with and has difficulties with. So as part of that path, the practitioner needs to learn how to eliminate attachment in relationships. Because if you don't eliminate your attachment in relationships, that means you're going to keep continuing to experience discontentedness in your relationships. So whether it's your life partner, your children, your parents, your friends, your family, your boss, your coworker, whomever, as long as you have craving, desire, attachment in your relationships, those relationships are going to keep experiencing discontentedness over and over again. So it's important to understand the second and third noble truth because the second noble truth explains the cause of discontentedness and it explains the elimination of discontentedness. So the second noble truth is discontentedness is caused by our own craving desire attachments because the mind wants everything to be permanent when everything in the world is impermanent. So I give examples about this when I teach the Four Noble Truths, but let me share some examples with you along the lines of relationships so that you understand this. So discontentedness is caused by this mental longing and strong eagerness, this wanting, these expectations, this grasping, this clinging, this holding on, because the mind wants everything to be permanent or it wants everything to be its way, right? The mind wants things to be the way that it wants it. It isn't comfortable with constant change because of the universal truth of impermanence. The unenlightened mind doesn't understand this universal truth. So as things are changing, the unenlightened mind doesn't like that. So what an individual will do is try to control this relationship. It'll try to put expectations on others and wanting other people to do things a certain way. But we struggle in these relationships. So let me give you an example. Let's just say we have a relationship that ends. Let's say that the relationship had so much difficulties and so much troubles throughout the relationship that it actually ends. This is not because of the other person that is causing us to be angry in that situation or causing us to be sad or causing us to be lonely. The cause of this loneliness, the cause of this anger, this sadness when a relationship ends is because the mind has craving, desire, attachment. The mind is holding on to this relationship, wanting it to be permanent. And now that the relationship has ended, the individual struggles and has this loneliness or this boredom, maybe even guilt or shame or some kind of anger or sadness that this relationship is over. Or let's just say that there's a death and this is a relationship that you have. And then say at death, when somebody dies, the mind has grief or sorrow. While those things for an unenlightened mind seem very normal, they seem very commonplace. Like, yeah, somebody died. Shouldn't I grieve? Somebody died. Shouldn't I feel sad? Well, you actually don't need to feel sad when somebody dies, when the mind is awakened to enlightenment. 
when somebody dies, an enlightened being understands that this is part of the universal truth of impermanence, and this is just a normal part of life, and that when a person dies, the reason why they died is because they were born. The only reason why someone dies is because they were born. The reason why the mind grieves and has sorrow, or even sometimes even anger or frustration at death, is because when this person dies, the mind is holding on. Your mind is holding on to whoever has died. And now that grief and that sorrow and that sadness sets in because the mind has this craving, desire, attachment, wanting this person to be permanent. And the mind doesn't understand impermanence that this person died because of impermanence, because they were born, they had to die. And because the mind is unawakened and untrained, the mind starts to grieve and have sorrow and sadness. But see what we do in the unenlightened state and when we don't have the wisdom of what true love is, is we associate these painful feelings at the time of death to love. We say, oh, we love them so much. That's why I'm grieving. Or I love them so much. That's why I'm so sad. Or I love them so much. That's why I'm so angry. But this is the mind living in delusion, in confusion, in ignorance, or unknowing a true reality. Is it love doesn't cause grief. Love doesn't cause sadness. Love doesn't cause anger. What's causing the grief, the sorrow, the sadness, and the anger is this craving, desire, attachment. It's the mind holding on and wanting to keep this person permanently that now when they've died, the mind grieves and it has sorrow because it's holding on and it wants this person to be permanent. The unenlightened mind doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. It hasn't deeply trained and it hasn't let go of this person prior to death. That all during your life, there was still craving, desire, attachment. The mind was clinging and holding on to this person. So now when the person has died, the mind grieves and has sorrow, has sadness, maybe even anger and frustration. When I was 15 or 16 years old, I had my very first girlfriend die. And I was angry, actually, when she died. I felt like she had left me. And I had a, a lot of deep sorrow. I went into a deep depression for many years at that time. And this was not because of the love that I had for this individual. This was because of the clinging, because of the craving, desire, attachment, and holding on, wanting her to be permanent because I misunderstood. And I didn't know at the age of 16 that it was my mind's own craving, desire, attachment, my own clinging that was holding on to this person that was causing the grief and the sorrow and the sadness, the anger to arise. And the same reason why we have those feelings at death are the same reasons why we have those feelings when someone gets married, for example. If you've been a parent or you've been really close to a brother or a sister and you went to their wedding and you cried and you grieved at their wedding, then it's because of craving, desire, attachment. It's because of clinging. The mind is holding on, wanting brother or sister. Or maybe if you had a mom or a dad who got a divorce and then they got married to a new person and maybe you cried during that time. This is the mind holding on and clinging to that individual, wanting to keep them permanently, not being willing to let go. So that same cause of the grief and sorrow and sadness at the time of death is the same cause of the grief and sorrow or sadness at the time of a wedding because the mind is holding on. But see, we attribute that grief or that sorrow or sadness at the time of a wedding is because you love them so much. You love them so much, but that's not actually love. I'm sure there's love in there, but the problem is, is that this craving, desire, attachment is being misunderstood as love. The mind thinks that this longing, this yearning, this wanting to hold on to this person, this clinging, the unenlightened mind thinks that's the love. But it's actually not the love. That's the craving, desire, attachment being misunderstood as love. As I said, I'm sure there's love in there. But the love is being tainted or polluted with this craving, desire, attachment. So these painful feelings that we feel in our relationships with our life partner or our children or other people like our parents and things like this. When these things are happening, we associate the painful feelings that we're experiencing 
as being because we love the person. But love doesn't cause anger. Once you understand what the definition of love is, love doesn't cause anger. It doesn't cause sadness. It's craving, desire, attachment that causes these disconsent feelings. So in order to liberate the mind in these relationships so that when somebody goes off to college or when somebody gets married or when somebody dies or when somebody just would like to do something their own way, instead of your mind holding on and clinging and having this craving, desire, attachment for things to be a certain way in this relationship, we need to do what the Buddha describes in the third noble truth which is to eliminate the discontentedness that we're experiencing during those situations, is we need to eliminate the craving, desire, attachments. We need to let go of this mental longing and strong eagerness in the relationship. We don't need to let go of the relationship. We can maintain relationships and have very healthy relationships as part of this path to enlightenment and actually being an enlightened being. An enlightened being has countless healthy relationships because they're not attached to any of the relationships. So there's nothing but peace and tranquility and politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respectfulness in all their relationships. And they can have many, many, many relationships because there isn't craving, desire, attachment. So in order for us to get to true love, we need to understand that the unenlightened mind is misunderstanding craving, desire, attachment as love thinking that these painful feelings that we experience in relationships are because of love. But love doesn't cause those painful relationships. So if you have a life partner or a child or something, and they go away on a trip or a business trip, and you're at home missing this individual, and you just feel like you almost can't move because of them being gone, or you just think of them constantly and you're missing them, or you're fearful when they leave and things like this, this is because the mind is clinging. The mind is craving, desiring, attached, having this mental longing, attempting to hold on to this person and wanting this person to be in your life permanently. And the mind misunderstands that this craving, desire, attachment and this clinging and holding on to this person, wanting them to be permanent when they can't be permanent. It's not possible for them to be permanent. They're going to sometimes need to leave and go other places. They're going to need to go on trips. They're going to go to college. They're going to get married. They're going to die. You're going to experience times where you're completely alone. And as long as the mind is clinging and holding on in this relationship, it's going to struggle. It's going to have difficulties and it's going to experience discontentedness. But it's not the love that is causing the discontentedness. It's the craving, desire, attachment that's causing that. Because see, what we oftentimes experience when we have a new relationship is say we meet a new uh, love interest, somebody who potentially could be a partner, a boyfriend or girlfriend, and maybe that might evolve into a life partner. What happens is when we first meet that person, we get all these pleasant feelings like, oh, wow, you know, I've got this new person. They're interested in me. Maybe they're asking you out on dates. Maybe they're calling you and checking in on you and seeing how you're feeling. And the mind starts getting all these pleasant feelings when you're getting this contact with this new person. And at the beginning of a relationship like that, oftentimes everything is completely perfect. The first two weeks, the first month, the first six months even. You can experience a relationship that it just feels like everything is completely perfect in this relationship. There's so much happiness and so much thrill, so much excitement in this relationship. But somewhere along the lines, this relationship starts to struggle. The reason why is because at the beginning of the relationship, we don't have craving, desire, attachment typically. We're only interested in seeing this person be well. We're usually interested in getting to know this person. We don't have any craving, desire, attachments. We don't have any expectations. We just meet this person. They call us a few times. We go out for a walk. We go out for a drink of fruit juice or smoothie. We go out to the movies, whatever it is. But somewhere along the line, you start getting those pleasant feelings more and more often but it takes more for the mind to get those pleasant feelings than it did in the past. And we start putting these expectations on our boyfriends or girlfriends. 
and we start asking them to meet our expectations. And this is what's called conditional love, or it's really craving desire attachment. But if we would like to call it conditional love, we could call it conditional love, where we say, okay, if you meet these expectations, if you meet what I'm expecting you to do, then now I'm in love with you. I'm so in love with you because you're meeting all my expectations. But as soon as the person stops meeting our expectations, then we say, I'm out of love with you. I've fallen out of love with you. But in reality, what's happened is the individual has put these expectations on the other person. And as long as the other person is meeting these expectations, we will say and we will function in a way that we say, I love you. But then as soon as they stop meeting our expectations, we say, I don't love you anymore. I don't feel those pleasant feelings anymore is what you're saying, is that because the craving desire attachment was there and I felt all those pleasant feelings at the beginning of the relationship because you were meeting my expectations. Now you're not meeting my expectations anymore. So I don't love you. This actually isn't love. This is our selfishness. This is our selfish desires saying that I love you. Therefore, I want you to do things the way that I want. And as long as you do things the way that I want, I will continue to say I love you. But as soon as you stop doing the things that I want you to do and you stop doing them in the way that I want you to do them, now I don't love you anymore. So again, this isn't love. This is craving desire attachment. And this is how we sabotage our relationships and we crush them because we put all these expectations on the other person, either internally in our own mind or even overtly, where we'll actually start requesting and asking them to do certain things based on our expectations, wanting them to be a certain way. We don't love them as they are. That's what true love ultimately is, even though I'm going to give you a bigger definition than that. What true love really is, is to love this person as they are and not load up all these expectations on their shoulders. Because if you can love people as they are, then you can love them all the time. You don't fall in love and out of love with people. And we even use this word love in relationship to other things. We may say, oh, I love my car or I love going to the movies. You can't love your car. Your car isn't a being, so you can't love your car. You can have craving, desire, attachment towards your car. You can have craving, desire, attachment to go to the movies, but you can't actually love a movie. You can enjoy a movie. You can like a movie. But when you understand what true love is, you actually can't love a movie. You can't love your car. You can't love a piece of chocolate cake. For example, you can have craving, desire, attachment for these things, and the mind is misunderstanding this craving, desire, attachment and calling it love. We do that frequently in the unenlightened state. But when you start understanding what true love is, you realize when you look back that what you thought love was actually was craving desire attachment. And as long as you're functioning through craving desire attachment and thinking that that's love and calling that love, you're going to continue to struggle in your relationships. So as we move into talking about true love, it's important to understand what causes discontentedness and painful feelings is craving desire attachment. And the way to eliminate them is to eliminate the craving desire attachments and understand that through multiple conversations and multiple interactions, you've probably been using this word love in various ways that is actually referring to craving desire attachment. I know I did for a very long time. I would say certain things about love thinking that it was love but in reality there might have been love in there but it was actually craving desire attachment so let me turn things over to all of you for any questions that you might have if you're in facebook youtube or zoom you can ask questions by putting those into the comment section and our moderators will see that and be able to be sure your question gets asked during the class if you're in Zoom, you can also electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow up questions directly. Well, so as for identifying if there is craving or not for some people who we mistakenly think it is love towards them, does this mean that one needs to have a list 
for every single individual. We are, we interact with them in daily life and try to figure if there is attachment to those or not. The way that you'll know that there's attachment in your relationships is if there's discontentedness in your relationships. So remember that red light that I was talking about in chapter 13? The discontentedness is the red light to alert us that there is craving, desire, attachment in any parts of our life. So if you're involved in conversations with people and you experience this happiness, this excitement, this thrill, this euphoria, when you see them or when they do something for you, you feel all this conditioned, pleasant feelings, then you know there's craving, desire, attachment. And if you feel painful feelings, that sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, fear, you know, shame, things like this, then you know that there's craving, desire, attachment in your relationships. When certain people are away from you, if you miss them or you feel lonely when they're away, that means there's craving, desire, attachment. If you feel jealousy or or resentment in your relationships, then you know that there's craving, desire, attachment there. So that's the indication that you know that there's craving, desire, attachment in certain relationships. And see, this is where your personal and professional relationships can really blossom. Because when you eliminate these conditioned feelings where you no longer experience any anger whatsoever or sadness or frustration or irritation or annoyance in your relationships, both personally and professionally, uh, you no longer have those conditioned feelings. That's where your relationships can be completely peaceful. And the interesting thing is, is even before learning about true love or learning about this path, there's oftentimes people who have certain relationships that are very peaceful and very loving, like friends and family or certain people in your life. It's like, wow, I'm just always completely at ease around these people. But these people over here, I have so much difficulty with. And this relationship really struggles or these two or three relationships really struggle, right? And the reason why is because in these relationships that are utterly peaceful, you don't have craving, desire, attachment, and they probably don't have craving, desire, attachment to you, perhaps. But these other relationships over here that where you really struggle and you really have difficulties, that's because of the craving, desire, attachment. So when we eliminate the craving, desire, attachment and we get to true love, now we can have peaceful relationships. Our relationships can be at ease with everybody. And this is where someone like Gautama Buddha was able to be so successful as a teacher because he never had harsh relationships. He never spoke a harsh word to any of his students. So therefore, his students never got angry at him because he never spoke a, a harsh word to them. He was practicing these natural laws of existence. So in all of his relationships, he was always utterly peaceful because he wasn't attached to his students. And that's why his community could grow and grow and grow and grow and grow because he wasn't damaging relationships, pushing people out of his life with anger and aversion and putting this wall between him and his students. Instead, he could live peacefully and exist in harmony with all the people that he was interacting with because his mind was enlightened. So when you get to the point where you understand craving, desire, attachment, and you eliminate all craving, desire, attachments, particularly in your relationships, then your mind can be at ease and you will be able to see that you'll be able to have loving and harmonious and peaceful relationships with everybody around you. And this is where you can be very, very successful in your personal and professional relationships because people just really enjoy being around you because you're never causing any harm to anybody. And therefore, they don't experience any harm from you in your intention, speech, and actions. And you can just have very fulfilling relationships. Well, you shared that there is nothing like I love chocolate or I love a kind of food. Does it make sense if one have love towards a pet animal? Yeah, you can have uh, love for a, an animal, for a living being. You can have love towards any living being uh, or even beings that have passed away. You can have unconditional love. L unconditional love is true love. You can have love for a living being, but you can't have love for an object like a chocolate bar or a car 
or a movie. These are all inanimate objects that when you understand when we move beyond here, the very next thing I'm going to share with you guys is what the true definition of true love is. Then you'll see that you can only have true love for beings. You can't have love for an inanimate object like a chocolate bar. Thanks, Tisha. Let's go to Yes, we have a question on Facebook from Bigwa. Why do we love our relatives more than other people? Because you're not understanding what true love is. And you're also not practicing equanimity, treating all people equally and fairly. So when you understand what true love is, you can see that you can actually love all people equally. What we think of as love in the unenlightened state is this craving desire attachment. That craving desire attachment, that burning desire to be close to our family and take care of our family and have everything exactly correct for our family and wanting them to be a certain way, this is all craving desire attachment. Masquerading is love. What happens is we misunderstand what love is. We think this craving desire attachment, this burning desire that we have in the mind, we think that that's actually the love, but it's just craving desire attachment. Masquerading is love. So when you understand that the love that you have, this true love is being tainted with this craving, desire, attachment, and that's why we struggle in our relationships, you can get rid of this craving, desire, attachment, and now practice true love with all beings. And that's what you can get to, is you can get to the point where you love your mom who's giving you birth in this life just as much as you love uh, your neighbor. When you understand what true love is, you can practice true love with your mom and you can practice true love with your neighbor or even somebody you've never met before. When you walk down the street, you can have a love for someone you've never even met before. But until you understand what true love is and get rid of this craving, desire, attachment, it's very murky. It's very hard to see that and to understand that clearly. So what our class is about today is to help you clearly see what craving, desire, attachment is, which is what we're talking about now. And then next, what I'm going to help you see is what is true love and see that very clearly. And when you see these as two separate things, then what you can see is in your relationships right now, there's relationships that you have craving, desire, attachment in, and you have love as well. And this is why you have discontentedness and you struggle in those relationships. But when you get rid of the craving, desire, attachment, you can actually practice a more pure love. And then this is a permanent love. True love, unconditional love is actually permanent. You can love everyone. You can love every being permanently because it's unconditional love. There are no other questions. Yes, teacher. Uh, Do you think that uh, having love towards uh, animals go against uh, consuming animals flesh? No, it actually encourages not consuming animal flesh because if we love animals, when I explain what true love is, you know, we're talking about love now without really understanding true love yet because I haven't described that. When we understand what true love is, then we wouldn't consume animal flesh or we also wouldn't do things like euthanize animals or things like this. So once we understand what craving, desire, attachment is, and that that's what's causing the painful feelings. And we're kind of calling craving, desire, attachment, love over here. That's what we've been doing throughout our life so far in the unenlightened state. But once we understand what true love is and we start deeply connecting with that, clearly being able to see that and then learning how to practice that in our relationships, now it's going to completely improve the way that we make decisions. We're not going to be interested in doing things like harming these other beings through consuming them or through euthanizing them or through doing all the other things that we do in our relationships to harm other beings. But because we don't understand what true love is in the unenlightened state, we're still practicing this craving, desire, attachment, thinking it's love. This craving, desire, attachment is masquerading as if it is love. And we say that we love a chocolate bar or we love a movie or we love a car. And we're using this word love in a way that is being misunderstood by our own mind. As long as we keep doing that, 
then we will do things like consuming animal flesh, like euthanizing animals, like speaking harshly to the people that are close to us. We're going to keep doing those things as long as craving, desire, attachment is in the mind, and we don't clearly see what true love is. Thanks, teacher. More question. Okay. So moving on to describing what is true love. Let's talk about true love, and then we'll talk about how to practice true love with ourselves, with our parents and caregivers, and even with our life partners. And we can even talk about children, if you guys would like as well. Even though I didn't include it in this chapter, we can easily talk about that. What true love is, is to have care for another person, not needing or wanting anything specific from the relationship, other than to see that person be well and be peaceful. That's what true love is, is over here, this craving, desire, attachment that is masquerading as love. What we say there is we say, I love you, therefore I want you to be with me because you make me happy. This isn't love. This is our selfish desires saying, I want you to be with me and when you're with me, I'll be happy. And when you're not with me, I'm not happy. And now I want to control you and I want you to do all these things. And as long as you meet my expectations, I will love you. But when you stop meeting my expectations, I don't love you anymore. That's not love. That's craving, desire, attachment. What true love is, is I love you. Therefore, I would like to see you be well. I'm not interested in wanting anything from you. I'm not going to put demands on you. I'm not going to try to force you or control you to do any particular thing. My interest is to see you be well. And this relationship with true love is basically seen as supporting and encouraging this individual rather than trying to control or crush or sabotage them in any particular way. Because our own selfish desires, when we're thinking this craving, desire, attachment, when we think that we know best and we want everybody to do things our way, we start trying to control others and trying to get them to do the things that we want to do because our own expectations our own craving, desire, attachments, wants, expectations now get cast onto this person and we put that on their shoulders and we try to control them and force them and get them to do the things that we want them to do. And as long as they do the things that we want them to do, we say, oh, I love you. But as soon as this person stops doing things the way we want, now we get angry or we get frustrated or we get irritated and now we crush the relationship and we sabotage it. We call it love and we say, I just am angry at you because I love you so much. Or I, I want you to do it this way because I love you so much. Well, if we really love the individual, then we wouldn't try to control them and force them to do things our way. If we really love the individual, then all we're interested in is seeing them be peaceful and be well. And part of them being peaceful and being well is to allow them to make their own decisions, knowing that their decisions are going to oftentimes be different than the decisions that you would make. So it's very difficult for somebody who has craving, desire, attachment to sit back and see a child or to see a life partner, to see our parents or other people make decisions that we feel aren't in their best interest. So with the wisdom that we have, we look at the decisions that they're making. We think it's a bad decision. And then because of our craving, desire, attachment, we rush in and we try to control their decisions and try to force them to do it our way because we think we have more insight than them and that we can see the problems and we want to avoid them from experiencing those problems. So we try to rush in and try to control them to do things our way. And this isn't love because as soon as we try to control them to do it our way, they don't like it. And they're going to get angry and frustrated. And then we don't like it because they're not doing things our way. And now it just explodes into this big argument and frustration and all kinds of problems in the relationship. Whereas if you don't have craving, desire, attachment, and you see somebody who you love headed for problems, what you can do is you can offer them suggestions. You can offer them support. You can ask them if they're interested in your ideas or your advice. And if they say yes, then you share that with them. If they say, no, I'm not interested in your advice, then you're completely comfortable and content with that. And you say, okay. 
and you're able to allow them to make whatever decisions they would like to make, even if it means that they're headed for trouble. This is the problem, is that we have so much craving, desire, attachment, is we don't want our children to fall down and hurt themselves, for example. Or we aren't interested in seeing our life partner that's headed for danger, and we feel like they're headed for danger. We want to restrain them and hold them back because we're so attached to them that if we see them struggle, it causes us painful feelings. It's not the love that's causing those painful feelings. It's our craving, desire, attachment, wanting things to be a certain way, expecting things to be a certain way. And because our mind is struggling with seeing our children walk into a problem situation and we're not comfortable with that, or we see our parents or our life partner walking into a troubled situation, we're not comfortable with that. And we want to rush in and kind of control their decision making. But this isn't love. This is our craving, desire, attachment. So when you let go of wanting things to be a certain way and expecting things to be a certain way, if you feel that you have wisdom that can help a loved one, then you might offer them some suggestions or some guidance. And when it comes from that place, your partner or your children or your parents will be more willing to listen to your advice and listen to your guidance because it's a suggestion. It's advice. It's guidance. And you've asked them. Are you interested in this right now? If we're we're talking about a five year old or a six year old, of course, we need to have those children do things a certain way. But we're talking about adult children or children that are close to adulthood. We need to start letting go and training them and helping them to be able to make wiser and wiser decisions. But as long as we are struggling with our own craving, desire, attachments, not feeling comfortable with seeing our people who we love struggle, we're going to try to rush in and control this relationship and it might actually sabotage it and crush it because we're not comfortable with our own painful feelings. And we think that the way to solve these painful feelings is to get this person to do things our way. And we think if this person does things our way, then that will avoid the painful feelings that we're going to experience. But it doesn't. What the real problem there is, is not that our partner isn't doing things our way. The real problem isn't that our parents aren't doing things the way we want them to do them. The problem is, is that our mind is having craving, desire, attachment to get that person to do things our way. Because if we practice this true love where we have this genuine interest in seeing them be well, and we just would like to support them and encourage them, then we can offer them advice, we can offer them guidance, but we wouldn't try to control their decisions. We would understand that them making decisions and experiencing the results of those decisions is part of the learning process. Whether the results of those decisions are good or bad, they have to experience the results of those decisions. Us rushing in to try to control their decisions is going to be seen by that person as part of the problem. They're going to look at us as the problem because if they're not practicing right view, when we try to control them and force them to do things our way, then they're going to look at us as trying to control them and force them to do things. And they're going to dig their heels in and not want to do those things our way. So the problem isn't that our friends and family and loved ones are not willing to do things our way. The problem is, is that our mind is craving for them to do things our way. And we have to be willing to let go and allow them to make their own decisions and experience the results of those decisions. And that's where we can practice true love, that we are just interested in seeing this person be well and be successful in whatever way that they choose to progress and walk forward in life. That we just love this person as they are instead of trying to fix them or make them be a certain way. But instead, we can reside peaceful, just allowing them to make their own decisions. If they say, hey, I would like to go on a holiday for two weeks by myself. Okay, wonderful. Uh, When were you thinking of doing this? And how were you planning to do it? Right? Instead of what? You're leaving for two weeks? 
don't you realize we've got all these things to do here? How dare you decide to leave for two weeks, right? That's our own craving, desire, attachment, holding on to this person and wanting them to be here with us permanently. Whereas if someone comes up with an idea where they would like to do something, if we try to control them, then that's our own craving, desire, attachment. All we need to do is listen to the people who are close to us, understand the things that they're interested in doing, and then where we can provide support, then we provide that support and encouragement, but allow each individual to make their own decisions. That's part of that true love. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys have around what true love is, because the more clear you guys see what true love is, the more you'll be able to actually practice it. Well, so as for this definition, it's clear that true love is based on just and characteristic to see others living in a peaceful way, living in a good way. So this doesn't include any happiness or excitement in this relationship. So what would be the motivation in this relationship if there is no happiness, no excitement? When we say there's no happiness and there's no excitement, what we should understand is that in our relationships, we don't have this conditioned happiness or conditioned excitement, where if you do things my way, I'm happy. That's conditioned happiness, right? You do things my way, I'm happy. You get the things that I want done, I'm excited. That's what we're eliminating. But in these relationships that are unconditioned love, we can have this joy where we don't require our relationships to be any particular way. And we can enjoy our relationships. We can have joy in our relationships. We can have fulfilling relationships where everybody is able to make their own decisions and do things their own way. So when we say that we're eliminating that pleasant feeling of happiness, excitement, elation. Don't think that you won't actually have enjoyment and uh, pleasurable experiences in your relationships because you will. It's just that your experiences in these relationships won't be conditioned on any particular thing happening or not happening. Because when you have unconditional love and you just love this person as they are, then you can be joyful and loving with them all the time. If they're sad, they're angry, they're frustrated, you love them. If they do things the way you suggest and you give advice, you love them. If they don't do things the way you suggest, then you love them. But when there's this craving, desire, attachment, then that means when they do things your way, you're happy, you're excited, you're elated. But when they don't do things the way that you want, you're going to be angry, you're going to be sad, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be irritated, and now you're going to talk to them in aggressive ways and hostile and, and unwholesome ways, and that's going to put a strain on your relationship. So you get rid of this craving, desire, attachment, where the mind is conditioning its feelings on what's happening in this relationship, and you just love this person as they are, allowing them to make their own decisions. And when they're making their own decisions, you just support and encourage them. You might offer them advice from time to time, and they may take your advice sometimes, and sometimes they're not going to take your advice because that's impermanence. And then you just be loving and kind, polite and respectful, whether they take your advice or whether they don't take your advice. And you can love them regardless. And in this way, you're not trying to control them. So therefore, your relationships are very much at ease and in harmony. And if they're not trying to control you too, then you guys can just completely love each other and support and encourage each other in life. And you can go through life in harmony because you're not trying to control them and they're not trying to control you. You're just supporting and encouraging each other along the way. You don't need or want anything from this person specifically. And they don't need or want anything specifically from you. Instead, you're just supporting and encouraging each other through life and whatever decisions that they make. And they're supporting and encouraging you in life and whatever decisions you make. You're truly experiencing life together. And you're living as what we would call life partners. You're really partners in this life, supporting and encouraging each other along the way instead of trying to control each other 
and get each other to do things your way. And when they do things your way, you feel so happy. And when they don't do things your way, you're angry and frustrated and you're aggressive and hostile with them. And this is how animals function, right? If you're a tiger or you're a lion or you're a bear, and as long as the other bears are doing what you want, everybody's happy. But as soon as the other bears are doing things you don't like, right? You start, and there's all this growling and fighting and clawing. That's what animals do. But what humans can do, if we become more and more human through attaining enlightenment, that's essentially what we're doing is getting closer and closer to being a human being, evolving out of this animal consciousness. By being more of a human being, when somebody does things that we agree with, okay, we're peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. When they do things we disagree with, we're peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. But if we function like an animal and we have this craving, desire, attachment, we're not practicing true love. When that other being does things that we disagree with, we're going to be angry. We're going to be hostile. We're going to be aggressive, just like an animal. So when we get rid of this craving, desire, attachment and these animalistic tendencies and we practice true love as a human being, now, if people do things we agree with, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. They do things we disagree with, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because we know whatever decisions they make, they're going to experience the results of those decisions. And we just have to put ourselves in a situation where we're not attached to the outcome of their decisions. If they're walking towards something that's going to result in uh, struggles for them, if we don't have attachment to them, then we just allow them to meet the struggles and we know that they're going to gain wisdom along the way and we might offer them guidance or suggestions along the way and if they listen to that they are accepting of that great if they're not accepting of that then that's fine too whatever decisions they make is their decision so this relationship becomes instead of both of us pulling in opposite directions and trying to pull the other person in the direction that we're going in Instead, we just realize that we're unattached. Instead of having a rope attached to this other person and you're trying to pull them one way and they're trying to pull you the other way, you cut this rope. You cut this attachment where now you're two independent beings and you're both functioning and making your own decisions and you both can be completely at ease and comfortable with each other's decisions and you allow each other to grow and mature and progress in life however they choose offering support, offering encouragement along the way, but only so much as that person is interested and willing to solicit your advice and your guidance. And as long as they're willing to listen and understand, then you provide them that guidance. But don't base your love off of whether this person listens to you or not. If they listen to my guidance and they follow my way, I will love them. If they don't listen to me and they don't follow what I say, I don't love them anymore. This is what we do when craving is masquerading as love and we have this craving desire attachment when we practice true love we can be content and peaceful and love this person no matter what whether they accept our advice or they don't if they do things our way or they don't do things our way we can still love them just as much no matter what Arabaz has a question she writes teacher david would you please talk about situations where someone else's decisions cause legal difficulties for us or physically make things difficult for us? Yeah, so this is a situation where we have to choose really wisely about the people that we choose to spend time with, whether it's our life partner or our friends or other people that we involve in our life, that when we choose a certain partner or we choose to associate with certain friends, that are into unwholesome things and making unwholesome decisions, it's our choice to be their friend that now that choice, now living with a life partner, if they're embezzling money or they're into illegal things or they're doing harmful things, those things are gonna affect us. It's their decisions that they're making that are unwholesome, but our decision to be close with a person who's doing unwholesome things, that's the decision that we're making that is resulting in the results that we experience from this person. So we need to learn to make choices 
about our life partners and our friends and people that we associate with based on these teachings. Because if we understand the five precepts, for example, that if somebody was killing, if somebody was stealing, if someone has sexual misconduct, if someone's lying, someone's taking substances that cause heedlessness, we know that for ourselves that would cause harm for us if we made those decisions for ourselves. So if we see somebody else making those decisions in their life, and then we choose to associate with them either as a life partner or a friend or something else or a coworker, or we choose to hire them as an employee, but yet they're lying or they're having these other challenges, we know that they're causing problems in their own life through practicing killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, or substances that cause heedlessness. And because they're going to be causing problems in their life, if we now choose to associate with that person, they can smear us. This is what the Buddha calls it. He talks about it as a snake moving through feces, that this snake might not bite you, but because it moved through feces, it can smear you and you can be smeared. So if we have people who, let's just say, are into uh, selling drugs, for example, and we go out in a car with them, maybe the police pull us over for a speeding, but yet they slip some cocaine under our chair uh, in, in the car. And now we get arrested for having cocaine when it wasn't even our cocaine. But we knew all along that this person was selling drugs, yet we associated with them. Right. So I don't know that you necessarily have that going on in your life, but you kind of get the picture of what I'm describing here is that as you make choices about your life partner, your friends, your coworkers, different people that you associate with, don't look down on people, don't judge them, don't think of it in that way. But just when you observe people who are constantly lying, you know that this isn't someone that you would be interested to associate with. Or if if you see somebody who's into substances that cause heedlessness, this isn't something that you would be interested in. Or if you see somebody that is involved in other things or making unwholesome decisions, you need to make a choice for yourself. Am I going to continue to associate with this person? Am I going to continue to be in a relationship with this person or not? And the thing is, is that once you get into this path to enlightenment and you start learning about this path, you might actually have people in your life now that you made decisions to associate with five years, 10 years, 30 years ago. And that had you known these teachings back then, you might not have selected that same person to associate with. So part of cleaning up your gamma and getting away from the unwholesomeness might mean that you need to you know, walk away from some relationships that you currently have, that you realize that now that you are learning these teachings, you realize that you're in some unwholesome relationships and you might decide like, okay, I need to just walk away and, and move on and beyond this relationship because it just keeps having problems over and over and over again. And no matter how much you choose to practice these teachings, if you're with a life partner, for example, who's using drugs and alcohol or who is uh, abusive or who is having sexual misconduct or who's lying, for example, no matter how much you practice these teachings, you choosing to be associating with that person as a life partner is going to continue to impact you and continue to affect you. So oftentimes as people move into this path and start learning about it, we might choose to move beyond certain relationships that we're currently in. And then when we cultivate new relationships, we will cultivate new relationships based on these teachings and we will ensure that the people we involve in our life are making wholesome decisions because we're not interested in being smeared by the snake going through feces. So you have to look at your life and look at the different relationships that you have and decide, you know, is this a relationship that you feel that you would like to continue to invest in? And is this someone who is making some wise decisions and it's wise for you to be their friend? Or is this a relationship that you would be better off moving on and just stepping away from? And this is part of cleaning up your karma cleaning up the decisions you've made in the past. Well, so practicing true love in this way, don't you think that if we are practicing true love towards some individuals who doesn't have true love towards us, then our love towards them will burn out after some time? 
So that's what I usually talk about when I get to life partners, but we can just talk about all of this at one time if you like, is if you're going to have a life partner, it would be very wise to have a life partner that is learning and practicing these same teachings. Because as long as you're understanding what true love is and you're practicing true love, if they're practicing craving desire attachment and they're thinking that that's love, you guys are going to be in conflict with each other all the time. Because for them, they're going to be trying to hold on and they're going to be trying to control you and they're going to be putting their expectations on you. And you're going to be trying to function in a way that just supports them and encourages them and interested in seeing them be well. And when they go away on a business trip and they come back, they're going to like, honey, did you miss me? No, I didn't miss you. And they're going to think, what? You don't love me? Why, why, why didn't you miss me? And it's like, oh, I was just peaceful here by myself for two weeks. Yeah, like, of course, I love you. It's wonderful that you're here and we can spend time together. But while you were gone, I, I didn't miss you. And if their mind is misunderstanding what true love is and they're associating craving, desire, attachment in this missing you with love, then as you guys have conversations, they're just going to completely misunderstand what you're talking about because they're thinking of craving, desire, attachment and that you should be sad when they're gone. You should miss them when they're gone. You should be lonely when they're gone. And because they're thinking of craving, desire, attachment is what love is. So it would be really wise if you're either starting a relationship or you're in a current relationship or if you've had a long-term relationship that as you understand more and more what true love is is that if you would like to maintain the relationships that you're in or you'd like to start a new relationship is that you guys have multiple talks about what true love is and how you guys are going to practice true love because if one person's definition of what love is is one way and another person's understanding of what love is another way then there's a conflict where you guys are describing love and thinking about love in completely two different ways so that means it's going to really strain on the relationship so oftentimes once a practitioner understands what true love is and you start learning how to practice that more and more then you're going to need to sit down with your current partners if you're in any current relationships or if you're looking to be in a new relationship going forward, then you're gonna to need to have multiple conversations in all of these relationships so that people understand what true love is. And if they're willing and open to learning that, then those conversations can go really well and they can be really fulfilling and you guys can really create a wonderful relationship for yourself. But if this other person isn't interested in understanding what true love is, and they continue to practice craving, desire, attachment, masquerading as love, then you guys are going to just keep struggling and struggling and struggling. So even my wife, who's Thai, and she's been on this path for 25 years in a more dedicated way, but really her entire life because she was born Buddhist, is I had to sit down with her on multiple occasions and help her understand what true love is and show her how to practice true love with me and show her how to practice true love with her son because she didn't understand what true love was. Uh, she didn't think when I first started talking to her, she didn't think you could have love and be enlightened. She thought that you can't have love and be enlightened and you can't have love. She was describing love as attachment. So it was multiple conversations that helped her to be able to see what true love is and how to practice that with me and then how to practice it with her son. And now everything's wonderful because she's practicing true love. I'm practicing true love. Her son's practicing true love. And there's lots of harmony in our family and in our household. But when any member of our household didn't understand what that true love was, and one of us might have been trying to control or put expectations on the other, that's where the difficulties really set in and there's all this discontentedness. So it's important that we have a common definition of what true love is amongst the people that we reside with the closest, particularly our life partners, our children, perhaps our parents, depending on how close they are, but particularly people in the same household. We need to understand what true love is. And sometimes that can be really challenging in environments where people aren't Buddhist, for example. So here, my wife is a Buddhist, so it was very easy for me to spend time with her, even though sometimes 
had to go around her ego a little bit and try to teach her and help her understand. But nonetheless, we had some really good conversations along the way that helped her understand what true love is because it would be a real struggle if one person thinks of love in one way and another person thinks of love in another way. So this can be part of establishing a really healthy relationship, having conversations around what love is. And it can also be a way of taking an existing relationship and bringing it up to a higher level. That if you're not currently practicing true love with your partner, the more you understand what true love is, you can have these multiple conversations and bring it up to a higher level where now you guys can be practicing true love together and be liberated from this constant discontentedness that you're experiencing in your relationships. Because as long as you're not practicing true love, as long as you have love masquerading and having this craving, desire, attachment, you're going to continue to have discontentedness. So if you have arguments or if you have heated disagreements or you get frustrated or irritated in your relationships, there's craving, desire, attachment there. You're not practicing true love yet. There's probably true love in there, I'm sure, but it's being tainted with this craving, desire, attachment. So you've got to get that out of there, both for you and for the other person. They need to do the work to get that out of there too so that you can bring this relationship to more peacefulness and more harmony. Let's go around. Teacher David, a question. Would true love um, um, cross all barriers of relationship? Meaning if there was a husband and wife or partner relationship, would that, um, uh, would true love translate um, into romantic love or if it's between a mother and a child would true love sort of um, override all sorts of um, relationship in the that's involved in that love uh, mother and child uh, partner to partner etc yes true love is uh, where we can love all beings equally because we can love our partner our life partner and we can love our children, we can love our parents, but we can also love our neighbors, our coworkers, and our friends, because what true love is, is this interest in seeing others be well, not needing or wanting anything specific for them and allowing them to be their own person, loving them as they are. This romantic love that people talk about, this is like the passion, this is like, the part where we have sexual relations, right? This is what romantic love is, is that if we're romantically in love with someone, it means that we're having sexual intercourse with this person. The sexual intercourse part is something we do because there is love, but it's also because of this craving, desire, attachment. We have this desire to please our partner, perhaps, and we have a desire to please our own being, too. We're looking for certain pleasant feelings. That's where that sexual intercourse the desire for sensual pleasures comes in with true love we don't necessarily want that from that person right when we get to the point where we're actually practicing true love we aren't aspiring for sexual intercourse so that's why i can love you manal i can love you jan i can love you donnie i can love uh, you bossom because I have a genuine interest in seeing you guys be well. I, I don't want anything from you guys. I don't want anything from my neighbor. I don't want anything from the person sitting in the traffic light next to me. I don't want anything from the person who cut me off in traffic. I can just love them all because I just would like to see them all be well. I don't need anything from them. I don't want anything from you. I don't want anything from these other people. I just am generally interested in seeing all of them be well. This thing that we call romantic love is really just that we have this craving, desire, attachment for sexual intercourse and sensual desires, pleasing them physically, and we are looking for physical pleasure ourselves. So we call it romantic love, but I wouldn't really call that love. There's love in there, I'm sure, but it's love with craving, desire, attachment. I can share that my wife and I didn't get to true love until we stopped having sexual intercourse. That's a decision that we both made as part of our practice on this path to enlightenment is that we both were interested in getting to enlightenment. So we came to the common understanding that we were going to eliminate sexual intercourse from our relationship. 
as long as we had that going on and other things as well, it became very difficult to be able to see true love and be able to practice true love. Because if somebody wants sexual intercourse and we want this central desire, we want this central pleasure, and the other person won't give it to us, now we have painful feelings. You're like, oh, this person doesn't love me. No, they're just not interested in having sex. So as long as we have the craving desire attachment for sexual intercourse, which we call romantic love, then we can get hurt and we can have painful feelings because we might have this craving for intimacy, but the other person doesn't. And when the other person doesn't want to have intimacy, we can have painful feelings because our mind isn't comfortable with impermanence that this person isn't going to be permanently wanting intimacy at the same time that we want intimacy. And we read that in the unenlightened mind as they don't love me because they don't want intimacy with me. So what true love is, is getting to the point where you don't want or need anything from anybody and you're just genuinely interested in seeing them be well and be peaceful and you can have this with everybody, Manal, your parents, your life partner, your children, your neighbor, your coworkers, the person that you've never met sitting at the traffic light next to you. You can have this genuine interest in seeing them be well and seeing them be peaceful and you don't need or want anything from them at all. And when you understand this and you practice this, this is where you can be at ease with everybody and have these really fulfilling and harmonious relationships. And that helps um, see a lot of um, clarity. Um, I think that when we label uh, relationships um, with certain, um, you know, descriptions like romantic love or nurtured love, uh, which we one would have towards a, a dog um, or something else between a uh, parent and child, uh, all the different relationships that one can have in one's lifetime. Um, I think that those labels are just um, representing cravings and attachments at the end. I mm -hmm. think that's one of the points that I see today. So thank you for that. Yes, you're 100% true there, uh, Manal. There's only one type of love, and it's true love. What we do is we try to define love in other ways, but like you said, it's just craving desire attachments masquerading as love you didn't say it that way but i will but this romantic love or this love to our children you know these different flavors of love is really just different craving desire attachment there's only one true love we can have love for our dogs for our cats for our friends for our family for our life partners for all of these people when we understand that true love is just this interest in seeing others be well and others be peaceful and in that way you can love everybody before you even meet them that's why you can meet a brand new person and you can just be like oh hi how are you so nice to meet you lovely to meet you here what's your name oh barbara oh barbara i've heard a lot about you you know you can just love somebody without having ever met them if your only interest is to see this person be well and be peaceful and you don't want anything from them whatsoever you can love someone without ever even having met them. And this is where you can just view the whole world as your family and you just love everybody, whether you've met them or you haven't met them because we don't want anything from them. As soon as we start wanting something from somebody, that's the craving, desire, attachment. And we're not going to constantly, permanently get our wants fulfilled. And because our wants aren't going to be fulfilled permanently, that means we're going to experience painful feelings in this relationship. So as soon as we have wants in this relationship, it's going to produce painful feelings. So when we eliminate the wants, which is eliminating the craving, desire, attachment, and our only interest is to see this person be well and be peaceful, now we don't experience any discontentedness whatsoever. My wife comes and says, hey, I'm going to America for three months. Oh, okay, so you need me to take care of son and be here for a while? Yeah, okay, well, uh, what do we need to do to make this happen for you? Or, you know, I would like to take three days off from work, or I'd like to take three weeks off of work. Oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. Uh, is there anything you need me to do? Nope, I got it covered. Okay, great, right? Instead of, what? You're taking three weeks off? You know, 
what about you paying the bills? What about you doing this? What about you doing that? You know, as soon as we start wanting something from somebody, once they tell us their decisions, we're not going to always agree with their decisions because we want something from them. So when we eliminate the wants, the expectations, the craving, the clinging, now we can just have a genuine interest in seeing this person be well and be peaceful. We can love everybody, every single person, and just have such fulfilling and harmonious relationships. Those are all the questions that I see right now. Okay, so let's talk about love oneself. The next thing is now that we understand what true love is as it relates to other people, that we have this genuine interest in seeing others be well and be peaceful and not putting all these wants and expectations on others, now we need to understand how to love ourselves, Because oftentimes we walk around and we don't love ourselves, even though we know there is no self, right? There's this non-self, there is no self. What we're talking about is this being, this being who you are right now. Not only do you need to learn how to practice true love towards others you need to learn how to practice true love towards yourself this being that we call jan or donnie or david or manal or bossom or nick we need to learn how to practice true love towards this being too because if there's this negative self-talk then uh, we can kind of degrade and diminish ourselves because we have all these wants and all these expectations if we have this expectation that we should be a perfect pure human being that we should learn this path and then six months later we should be enlightened and we have these expectations of ourselves. now when we slip up and we're not practicing right speech now we're degrading ourselves. we're talking negative to ourselves, and we look down on ourselves, and we disparage ourselves. we have this negative self-talk and then that erodes our confidence and we have difficulties in the world or if we have this expectation this craving this desire this want to meditate three times a day and then we don't meditate three times a day because it's impossible to permanently meditate for three times a day that's impossible so when we meditate twice a day or we only meditate once a day now because we put those same expectations that we sometimes put on others we put those expectations those wants those craving desires on ourselves. now we have this difficult relationship with ourself we start degrading ourselves. We start diminishing ourselves. We lo start looking down on ourselves, and this causes a lot of difficulties in our relationships uh, with ourselves. Because now these same expectations, the same controlling nature that we have towards others, we're trying to do that with ourselves, and we're not meeting our own expectations. And because we're not meeting our own expectations, now we feel lesser of a human being. We feel like we're a bad person and we walk around with our head low and we're lacking confidence. So if we get rid of these craving desire attachments, these wants and expectations towards others, that's going to liberate our relationships with others and we'll feel more freedom in our relationships. We'll have more fulfilling and harmonious relationships with them. But we'll also, if we let go of those craving desire attachments, those wants and expectations directed towards ourselves then we can have a more freeing, more liberating relationship with ourself. And we won't talk to ourselves in negative, harmful ways. When we have certain goals, objectives, and interests that we would like to fulfill, we can pursue them as goals, objectives, and interests, knowing full well that we're not going to meet those exactly when we want, how we want, and when we want. Instead, we just pursue them as a goal, objective, and interest, not with this strong craving, desire, attachment. So if we kind of let go of the pressure of pushing ourselves and pushing ourselves and pushing ourselves because of this craving, desire, attachment, and we don't put these expectations and wants on ourselves, now we can have this more harmonious and fulfilling relationship with ourselves, and we won't talk to ourselves in negative ways. We might wake up in the morning, we might say, you know, I'd like to do X, Y, Z today. And then you start doing and walking towards X, Y, Z, and you realize, oh, I need to take care of A, B, C. I'm not ready for X, Y, Z. Even though you woke up with the intention of doing X, Y, Z, now you decide to go and do ABC instead because you realize that ABC needs to get done. And it's ABC that you need to uh, really focus on. So when you let go of the craving, desire, attachment, the wants and expectations, 
for this being yourself to be a certain way and you start treating yourself more loving and more kind, just love yourself as you are. Not this conceited base love, not this arrogance or this pride or this conceit that you might have in that type of love, not that. That's arrogance, that's conceit, that's pride. But just be kind to yourself, speak kind words to yourself. So then if you have certain goals and you wake up with those goals and you're pursuing a certain day or a week or a month or a year, and you meet 80% of those goals, instead of thinking that glass is half empty, think, wow, I met 80% of my goals. That's outstanding. That's wonderful. Or even if you met 40% of your goals, okay, that's outstanding. That's what I needed to do. That's what I was able to do. That's what this year I was able to do. I was able to accomplish 40% of my goals. Outstanding, wonderful. I'm closer to the ultimate goal. But see, the thing is, is that we put these unrealistic expectations on others, then we tend to put those unrealistic expectations on ourselves, and now we beat ourselves up for not fulfilling those expectations. The problem here is that we're putting expectations on others, we're putting expectations on ourselves, and now we start judging ourselves. We start judging others, good or bad or wholesome or unwholesome. We start looking down on others and we start looking down on ourselves. So we need to cultivate these more healthy relationships with others by first cultivating this healthier relationship with ourself where we're not looking down on ourself and disparaging ourself and judging ourself. By not judging ourselves, by not disparaging ourselves, by not diminishing ourselves, then we will have a tendency to not do that to other people too. If we're uplifting and encouraging and motivating to ourselves, then we can be uplifting, motivating, and encouraging to others as well in our relationships. And that's just our way of being and how we conduct ourselves in the world. So, this relationship that we have with ourselves is really important. Let me pause here and see what questions you guys have. Richard hey, David, we have a question from Jan here on Zoom. She asks, would you please advise about times when we feel negatively towards ourselves? Yeah, look at what it is that's causing that negativity. There's going to be some craving, desire, attachments there. There's going to be this judging, this measuring and comparing this wanting, this craving, this yearning, and dissecting that and stripping it away and seeing exactly what that is, is, is really helpful. So that breathing mindfulness meditation that we do where when we see in meditation any thoughts that arise, we cut them off and let them go, applying right effort to cut them off and let them go, we develop this mindfulness and this awareness of mind that when we see any thoughts whatsoever, we cut them off and let them go. We're not trying to eliminate thoughts in breathing mindfulness meditation. We're just trying to train the mind to be aware with mindfulness more and more when our mind is off the breath. And we're trying to train the mind to more easily let them go. So then in daily life, now when you start seeing that you're starting to be negative towards yourself and you're directing that negative self-talk to yourself, you see that as something unwholesome because your mind has mindfulness and awareness now. And now, because you train the mind in meditation to cut off the thoughts and let them go, when you see that negativity and that directed towards yourself, cut that off and let it go. And just take the mind in the other direction. And as you do this for, you know, depending on how significant your negative self-talk is, it might take many months. But eventually, slowly over time, as you get better and better at being aware when the mind starts talking negatively towards yourself, and you get better and better at cutting it off and letting it go, eventually you get to the point where you've eliminated that unwholesome quality from the mind and you won't have that anymore. But you'll probably have to go through many weeks and many months of observing when the mind wants to disparage yourself and talk down and look negative at yourself. You're going to have to go through many weeks and months of cutting it off and letting it go. And then the mind eventually submits and it stops doing that. So that's what you've got to do is train in meditation, train outside of meditation and cut it off and let it go. And then at a certain time, you can look and be like, what, what is my mind craving here? There's something my mind's craving that it wants. It's either judging or measuring or comparing and then be like, oh, 
I'm driving this 30 year old Toyota car. My friend just got a BMW and now I want that BMW. My mind thinks that I'm a loser just because all my friends got a BMW. I feel like I'm a loser because I'm driving a, a Toyota that's 30 years old. Well, no, I'm just choosing to prioritize my expenditures in different ways than my friends. My friends chose to buy a BMW and I choose to drive the 30 year old Toyota because it gets me back and forth to where I would like to go and I use my funds in other ways. But see, when our mind is looking at others and we're doing this measuring and comparing, oftentimes we might degrade ourselves if we think that somebody else is better than us. This is just one reason why we might have negative self-talk, but there's multiple reasons why we might have negative self-talk, but wherever that comes up, you observe it with mindfulness or awareness, and then you cut it off and let it go. And then more and more, it just won't do that anymore. Well, we'll go back to Basim now. Thanks, Manad. Well, so uh, now you're sharing that from what you have shared. Uh, if one has expectations from the other individual, the mind will experience discontentedness. So what if the other individual is able to fulfill these expectations? You shouldn't ever put the expectations on others. Because if they fulfill the expectations, you're going to get these pleasant feelings and you're going to really revel in that and you're going to expect that and you're going to want that and you're going to do that more and more and more. If you're putting expectations on others and they fulfill them, wow, I got those pleasant feelings. Let me put some more expectations on them. And then, wow, I got those pleasant feelings. Let me put more and more and more. And this is how we sabotage our relationships. When we first meet like a a new boyfriend or girlfriend, like I mentioned, we don't have usually craving, desire, attachments or wants or expectations. So the, the beginning of the relationship is just so peaceful and so harmonious. And then somewhere along the line, we have this one or two or three expectations. And then they meet those. And then, ah, we add some more and we add some more and we add some more. Next thing you know, we got this huge long list of expectations of what we want from this other being. And it becomes so massive that this other being can't fulfill these expectations permanently. It's impossible. And that's where we say, ah, I don't love them anymore. (laughs) It's not that you lost your love. It's that you're no longer experiencing pleasant feelings because they're no longer fulfilling your expectations. And now that you're not getting those pleasant feelings from them fulfilling your expectations, you say, I don't love them anymore. Well, there's love in there somewhere, but it wasn't love to begin with. It was craving, desire, attachment, these wants and expectations masquerading as love. You were experiencing these pleasant feelings when they were meeting your expectations. And then those expectations got so enormous that no human being could fulfill those expectations permanently and now you've just crushed your relationship you've just sabotaged it the more and more expectations you've piled on this person so wherever you see that you're trying to put expectations on people you've got to pull the mind back and you've got to restrain it and you're probably going to have to start changing your language this is part of what practicing this path to enlightenment is is because The ways that our mind thinks, we've developed certain speech patterns around the way that our mind thinks. And when we see somebody do something, we react in a certain way and that's become first nature for us. But now when you start responding through the Buddhist teachings and you're no longer reacting and you've changed your thinking patterns, instead of saying, oh, mom, I want you to do it this way or Husband, why are you doing it that way? I don't like you to do it that way. That's what we used to do in the past. Or son, daughter, stop doing that. I don't want you to do that anymore. Stop, right? Like those are the old ways that we were handling things before we understood things like right view, right intention, right speech, right action, and other things. So now when we start changing our thinking in the way that we're practicing, we might see our son doing something. We say, son, I have a suggestion for you of how you can do that better. Uh, let's talk about that. Or would you like to talk about that? Or are you interested in talking about that? Or wife, husband, I see you're getting ready to remodel our bedroom. Is this something that I can maybe contribute to since we both share this room together? Are we able to talk about this and come up with a joint plan together? Right? You kind of ask questions and you think about ways of creating harmony in the relationship rather than 
You're going to remodel this bedroom without consulting me? Are you serious? Why would you do that? Right? Like when we start talking harsh and aggressive with our partner like this, using wrong speech, this is where our craving desire attachments move to anger. And now we start motivating all these unskillful conduct. So when we eliminate this craving desire attachment, knowing that our partner or our children, our parents, our neighbors, our friends, they're not necessarily on this path and they're not functioning in the same way that we're functioning. We have wisdom that is beyond what they understand because they're not on this path. So we take on the extra responsibility of having this higher consciousness and realizing that we need to create the harmony here because they don't necessarily know how to do that. So if they run off and they're trying to fulfill all their craving, desire, attachments, and they're doing things that we feel are going to cause harm, then we have to find ways of talking to them and asking them questions, which means we're going to have to change our thinking patterns and we're going to have to change our speech patterns and the way that we talk to people. Instead of being demanding and controlling and forceful in our speech, we're going to need to be inquisitive and thoughtful and understanding and patient. You know, these are the kind of qualities of mind and speech that we need to start practicing. And this is what's going to create the more harmony in your relationships. And even though people aren't practicing these teachings who are around you, when you are practicing them, they will feel more at ease around you because you're not being demanding, controlling, and forceful. You're being patient and kind and friendly and understanding, and you're asking questions and you're offering suggestions rather than controlling, demanding, and demeaning. Thanks, you. No more questions. Okay, so let's talk about love with our parents and caregivers. Oftentimes when we grow up, we have certain expectations and we have certain wants for our parents and our caregivers. We can grow up in a certain household and our parents can either be really wise and practicing true love and show us wonderful ways to do things in the world. Or we can grow up in households that are quite hostile and quite aggressive and showing us all the wrong ways to do things in the world. In both situations, we are actually learning. We can learn through wisdom and good, wholesome ways of doing things, but also we can learn in situations where people are doing things in very aggressive and harsh ways too and realize that that's not what we would like to do. But we can be left with situations where if we put a lot of expectations on our parents or caregivers and they're not fulfilling those expectations, we can have these painful feelings because of our craving, desire, attachments, our wants and expectations. And now we associate those painful feelings with they don't love me. Again, it all comes back to this craving, desire, attachment, these wants and expectations that because our parents and caregivers aren't meeting our expectations, we can often feel like they don't love us and we can feel empty and void inside. And this puts struggle and strain on our relationships. So we need to get to a place with our parents and caregivers that we also love them as they are that we're not trying to control them to be any particular way, that they're making decisions based on whatever wisdom they've acquired in their life. And as part of this wisdom that they've acquired in their life, they're going to make decisions differently than what we would. But if we have an expectation that everyone around us should make decisions exactly the same way that we would, that's the mind craving permanence. We need to understand that our life partners, our children, our parents, our caregivers, they're all going to make decisions differently than we would. That's okay. That's okay. See, we see that as a problem in the unenlightened state. We see the problem of our parents and caregivers making decisions differently than we would. We see it as they're the problem, that they're not making good decisions. Well, it's not necessarily that they're not making good decisions. It's just that they're not making decisions in the same way that we would. So if we let go of this craving for everyone to make decisions in exactly the same way that we would, and we just love them as they are, and we're comfortable with this impermanence that they're going to make decisions that we sometimes agree with, and our parents and caregivers are going to sometimes make decisions that we disagree with. And even when we disagree with their decisions, we can still love them. We can still have this interest in seeing them be well 
and this interest in them being peaceful. And as long as we crave agreement in that every decision that our parents make, we need to agree with it, we're going to have a real difficult relationship with our parents because we're not going to agree with every decision our parents make. That would be permanence, right? So as long as our mind is craving to have this permanence and for every decision that our parents make that we agree with, we're going to have discontentedness as long as we do that. So we need to get to a place where we just love them as they are. We would like them to be well. We would like them to be peaceful. We might offer them suggestions. We might offer them encouragement, but we don't expect or want them to make decisions in exactly the same way that we do. If we see them headed for challenges, if we think that we have some wisdom that can help them, then the Buddha gives us guidance on how to guide them and how we could potentially help them. So I'd like to share some of the words of the Buddha with you. If, Bossom, you could move to the next slide, you'll see these words of the Buddha where he talks about essentially parents and how much we should respect them and why we should respect our parents. And then he describes that when our parents are lacking certain aspects of these teachings, how we can help them in order to develop the qualities that would be helpful in this life. So here, this is titled, Repaying One's Mother and Father. He says, Monks, there are two persons that cannot easily be repaid. What two? One's mother and father. Even if one should carry about one's mother on one shoulder and one's father on the other, and while doing so, should have a lifespan of a hundred years, live for a hundred years, and if one should attend to them by anointing them with balms, by massaging, bathing, and rubbing their limbs, and they even void their urine and excrement there, one still would not have done enough for one's parents, nor would one have repaid them. Okay, so this first paragraph, what the Buddha is saying is, if you lived for a hundred years and you carried your mother on one shoulder and your father on the other shoulder and you carried them all through life and you cleaned up their urine and their excrement and you massaged them with bombs and you bathed them, you rubbed their limbs, you still wouldn't have done enough to repay them. Okay, so let's continue. Even if one were to establish one's parents as the supreme lords and rulers over this great earth, abounding in the seven treasures, one still would not have done enough for one's parents, nor would one have repaid them. So if you established your parents as ruling over the entire world, the Buddha says, you still haven't done enough for your parents. For what reason? Why haven't you done enough if you've done all this stuff? This is quite an amazing child if you do all this stuff for them. The Buddha says the reason why we haven't done enough is because parents are of great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them the world. Essentially what he's talking about there is that our parents are our original teachers. Our parents are the ones who taught us to brush our teeth, taught us how to eat, comb our hair, get dressed, how to urinate, how to defecate, how to do so many things in the world. They were the ones who taught us to walk taught us to speak, right? All these life-sustaining activities, all these life-sustaining tasks that we now kind of take for granted as adults, it was our original caregivers, our parents, our grandparents, people who adopted us, or all different shapes and forms and fashions of parents and caregivers that we have today, that it was these original caregivers that were our original teachers. And because they worked, because they fed us, they showed us the world, they brought us up, they gave us all these original life-sustaining activities, we could not repay them enough for that. Because now that we have this life in this world and we're able to sustain our life, we have the ability to attain enlightenment and get out of this whole cycle of rebirth. So all these life-sustaining tasks and activities that they taught us, bringing us up, feeding us and showing us the world, all those things that they did for us allowed us to mature to the point where we are today. And now we're able to 
benefit from things like learning in these classes and getting to the point where we can actually attain enlightenment. So the Buddha sees it as we essentially have this debt of gratitude and appreciation towards our parents because of them being our original teachers, our original caregivers, who gave us all these life-sustaining activities, even the ability to speak, and maybe they helped us read and write and other things like this. So the Buddha talks next in this next paragraph about now that we understand this debt of gratitude and that they were our original caregivers and gave us this life to be able to now potentially attain enlightenment and escape this whole cycle of rebirth, well, what should we do in order to repay that back to them? Now that we've experienced this benefit of them investing time, effort, energy, and resources for the first 18, 20, 25 years of our life to get us up in this world and operating as a functioning human being, what can we do when we see that they're struggling and they're having difficulties? What can we do to help them in this life now that you're learning these teachings, now that you're learning how to eliminate discontentedness, you're learning to eliminate the struggles and difficulties in life, you're learning these natural laws of existence, but you see that your parents don't know these teachings and they're going to continually struggle and have discontentedness and experience the cycle of rebirth. What can we do as children to repay them for this debt of gratitude? And that's what this next paragraph the Buddha shares. But monks, if when one's parents lack confidence, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in confidence. What he means by confidence is confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, and the community. So when one's parents misunderstand and don't know about the Buddha, the teachings, and the community, the Buddha suggests that we share this with them. And we need to share with them in humble ways. We can't just barge in and kind of try to force them and put these expectations on them that they should practice these teachings. But we need to find these kind of subtle and humble ways to perhaps see if it's something that they would be interested to learn in order to have this confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, in the community. If when one's parents are unwholesome, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in virtuous behavior or moral conduct. So where we observe that our parents are practicing wrong speech or wrong action or wrong livelihood, that's the moral conduct that the Buddha teaches. What he suggests here is that we encourage, settle, and establish them in practicing moral conduct. I can give you an example from my life. You know, my grandparents were people who were really influential to me and they taught me tons of wisdom. They grew up and were born in the 1920s. They lived through the Great Depression. They went through World War II. They saw a very different America than what I saw. When they grew up, it was African-Americans would go to one water fountain and they would go to another and they went to one bathroom and African-Americans went to another and they ate in one restaurant and African-Americans went in another. They went to school in one place and African-Americans went in another. So when I was growing up, I heard certain racist comments from my grandparents. You know, my grandfather went away to World War II and he was killing Asian people in, in Japan as part of being a soldier in World War II. So when I was spending time with Asian people, you know, he had certain racist comments that he would say about Asian people and I would hear other racist comments. So when I heard these things growing up, I didn't just let it slide. I didn't just, you know, adopt the same type of thinking that they had. Instead, where there was opportunity, when me and my grandfather were alone or me and my grandmother were alone, I would sometimes try to encourage them to not think that way. And I would kind of give them advice here and there in a very humble way. And slowly but surely over time, it actually worked because slowly and gradually over time, I saw this change in the way that they thought about things. And by the time my grandfather passed away, and even now with my grandmother being 99 years old, she's not racist at all. She has grandchildren and people of our family that are of different ethnicities and she loves everybody equally. But it took a lot of time to gradually help her see that, to settle and establish her in this moral behavior, this moral conduct. But of course, I didn't talk to her about it in that way. I had to find very humble and very uh, loving ways to help my grandmother be able to see that. 
and the same thing with my grandfather as well. So it's not that you need to break out the books and you need to put these expectations and push and force them to do these things, but just where you see things, you might gradually guide them towards more virtuous behavior or moral conduct. And that's gonna help them in their life because now when they start functioning with this better moral conduct, they'll experience better results in their life. If when one's parents are selfish, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in generosity. Because remember, generosity is what trains the mind to let go and let go of craving. So we practice generosity as a way to train the mind to let go and no longer be selfish and hold on to things. So if you observe that your parents are selfish and they hold on to things very tightly, then in certain little situations you might encourage and try to help them see that practicing generosity would be really helpful for them. And that's what the Buddha is sharing here. If when one's parents are unwise, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in wisdom, right? So where you see that they're not practicing these teachings, if you see that they're lying or they're taking substances that cause heedlessness, or you see other things that you know are part of this path that would really improve their life, then the Buddha is saying that you find kind and polite and respectful ways to share this with your parents, not putting expectations on them, not forcing them, not trying to control them, but kind of lightly giving them advice and suggestions as they're willing to understand that. And if ultimately they decide that they're not interested and you can see that they're not interested in hearing your advice, then you just you know choose to, to not share with them. But you can actually share these teachings without using the B word of Buddhism, right? You don't need to use the B word when you share these teachings with your family and your friends and particularly here, your parents. So you can share things with them about being generous and being wise and things like that without using this word of Buddhism or B because oftentimes people are very set in their ways and not maybe interested in learning something new so you kind of find skillful ways to share this stuff with them in ways that would help them so when you do these things when you share with them and you try to encourage and settle and establish them in confidence in virtuous behavior or moral conduct in generosity and in wisdom then the buddha says this he says in such a way one has done enough for one's parents, repaid them, and done more than enough for them, right? So you've essentially repaid them enough once you get to the point that you've tried to encourage, settle, and establish them in confidence and virtuous behavior or moral conduct, generosity, and wisdom. And that's how we repay our parents for this life-sustaining activities and tasks that they taught us growing up is that we now give them back something that's going to benefit their life. And this is how everything works here in Thailand. You know, in America, when we grew up, or, or at least as I was going through the workforce, we had things like 401k programs and IRAs and things like this that we kind of took care of ourselves, so that when we get older, we go to senior citizen homes and then we pay for ourselves, and we don't have our children pay for us. But here in Thailand, the way they do things is the parents take really good care of the children. The parents teach the children and give them this wisdom and help them to learn these teachings of the Buddha. And then as the children age and the parents are aging, at some point the parents stop working and the children take care of the parents. There's no 401k or IRA or retirement accounts here in Thailand. There are, but you don't really see people having those. Instead, what you're investing in as a parent is you're investing in your children. You're investing in their education. You're investing in helping them become more and more wise and getting more and more wisdom. You're helping them learn these Buddhist teachings because the parents know that when you're 50, 60, 80 years old, it's these children who are going to be taking care of you. And would you be interested in an unwise person taking care of you at the age of 80 when you're getting older and decrepit? You would like to have your children be wise and be making wholesome decisions. So here in Thailand, what I see is I see parents investing a lot of patience, a lot of time, effort, energy, and resources to 
teach their children and grow their children because they know that these children are going to be the ones that are taking care of them as they get older. So they have a vested interest in seeing these children become very wise individuals. So this is something that we can do as we have children is understand that they're going to be making decisions about our life when we're 70, 80, 90 years old. And it would be wise for us to impart wisdom in our children so that they're making wise decisions for us as we get older. If your children are older now, they're in their teens or their 20s or their 30s, and you didn't do that with them growing up, you can still do that now. You can start to gradually help them gain wisdom and learning and understanding. And then as you age, you'll see that these wise individuals will now be able to make better and better decisions for you as you age and you might not be able to make as many decisions for yourself as you once thought that you could. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys have about our parents and caregivers. Well, uh, actually it's not a question related to this point, but uh, in general I was wondering about how could the Buddha uh, teach teachings that is beneficial in mostly every aspect in life, in every point, in every struggle in life, we can see that these teachings are very beneficial. Yeah, when you understand the natural law of gamma and these natural laws of existence, then you start seeing that really what we are is we're this, this living being that has all these relationships in the world. And what we're looking to do is we're looking to have peacefulness and harmony in all these relationships that we have in the world, including the relationship with ourself, the relationship with our parents, the relationship we have with the environment and the earth and all these other things. So by understanding that when you cause harm to others, harm is going to come to you, then you start looking at the world in a very different way and you start making decisions in a very different way than you did in the past. So the Buddha, knowing that parents and caregivers are such an important asset to our life, that this is a very important relationship. You know, out of every single person in our life, it's typically our parents that are there to the very bitter end. You know, no matter what trouble we get into, no matter what difficulties and struggles we have, no matter how sick we get, it's our grandparents and our parents and our aunts and uncles and others who are there for us uh, no matter what. Or our friends and, and co-workers and others might be long gone, but our family is there to care for us. And if we're looking to cultivate healthy relationships that are free of harm, then we should look at all of our relationships, including our parents and caregivers, because whatever we put out is going to come back to us. So if we have these strained relationships with our parents and caregivers or our children or our life partners, then that's what's going to come back to us. So by creating more peacefulness and harmony in our relationships, in those times of struggles and difficulties when we need others, they're going to be more than willing to help us. And that's because we've practiced generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom in those relationships. So because we're not causing harm to others, when we need help, those people are right there for us to help us. So this beneficial and wholesome conduct is uh, will be good for us and even for others who are around us, right? Yes, there's never a time where you should settle for a strained relationship whether it's in business, whether it's in your personal life or what have you, your goal should be to have harmonious relationships all throughout your life. But realizing that you can't have permanence, right? There's going to be relationships where the other person perceives you in a certain way and they don't like you and they don't want to be around you. Okay, that's fine. That's their choice. I'm not going to cling and hold on to them. But for you and the way that you practice, you would like to function in a way that's not causing harm to any beings. So therefore, the people who are in your life, you're not causing harm to them. So therefore, harm is not coming to you. You should never settle for a strained relationship. Now, if there is a strained relationship that's in your life right now, you will need to, as part of your journey to enlightenment, decide, is this a relationship that I can sort out and we can eliminate some of this strain and it's a significant enough relationship that I need to do that and I need to clean up 
this relationship and get it on better footing? Or is this a relationship that I can walk away from and that that would be a better thing here because the relationship is just too difficult, too strained, and it's not a significant enough relationship for me to invest the time, effort, energy, and resources to resolve. So as part of decisions that you've made in the past, your old gamma, there's going to be relationships right now in your life that you decide to commit to and that you are committed to that relationship and you would like to clean it up and make it better. And then there's going to be relationships that you decide, okay, the best thing here is just to move on. And that's the best way to function here. And that's a way to clean up your gamma so that now the people that are around you, you're cultivating these healthy and wholesome friendships and relationships so that the people that are around you, you're loving and kind and compassionate with them and they're loving, kind and compassionate with you. There shouldn't be any space in your life for aggression and hostility and harshness and arguments and things like this. If you're arguing and you're aggressive and you're hostile, that's what's going to come back to you. And if that's what you've been doing in the past, then you've probably got some of that stuff still around you today. So you're going to need to clean all that up in order to get to this peaceful, calm, serene, and consent mind with joy. You're going to have to clean up your own conduct first by improving your wisdom, your moral conduct, and your mental discipline. But then through you cleaning up your conduct, you might see your children and your life partner will also clean up their conduct as well as you guys gradually work towards improved results. But then there's going to be certain relationships that it's just better that you walk away from. And that's the best way to clean up that particular situation and get you to a point where you don't have harsh, hostile, and aggressive relationships in your life. Thanks, sir. No more questions. Okay. So we talked a bit already about life partners, so I don't know that we necessarily need to talk about that other than to share this. I said earlier how you should look for life partners and cultivate relationship with life partners that are practicing these same teachings. And what I mean from that is, yes, it would be ideal if your life partners were practicing the Buddhist teachings. That would be absolutely ideal. And you'll see the most harmony in your relationships when everyone in your household is practicing these same teachings. But because you may or may not be in a Buddhist community, that may not be something that you're able to actually experience right now. Right, Me living in Thailand and associating with so many Thai people, 96% of Thailand is all Buddhist. So everywhere I go, people are functioning within these same teachings. And my wife and my son, and we're all in agreement. And this is one of the reasons why I consider Thailand to be like heaven on earth. It's so peaceful here because people are just all functioning through these same type of teachings. Well, when I say that it's important to have a life partner that is functioning through these same teachings, yes, it would be ideal if your partner decided to learn the Buddhist teachings. But if that's not possible, what I mean by these same teachings is things like the five precepts. These five precepts were actually taught by Jesus Christ, but in a different way. They're taught in Hindu teachings. They're taught in Muslim teachings, I feel. I don't know as much about Muslim teachings as I do some of the others, but things like not killing, not stealing, not having sexual misconduct, not lying, not taking substances that cause heedlessness. These are the five precepts that significantly reduce unwholesome results in our life. We know that through the Buddhist teachings, but there's people in your family that might be Hindu and they learn these same exact things through the Hindu teachings. And that's what I mean by having partners that are practicing these same teachings or your partner might be Christian and they might be practicing those five precepts in their own ways as the way that Jesus Christ taught them or someone in your family might be a Muslim and they might have learned these things through the Muslim teachings so when I say that it's important to have life partners that are practicing these same teachings as it relates to true love and love without attachment you guys need to be on board with that common definition but in terms of having life partners in general, then it doesn't mean everybody in your life has to be Buddhist and that you should exclude people who aren't Buddhist from your life. But instead, because you understand the five precepts and you understand them in the way that the Buddha taught them, 
other people understand them in the way that Hindu teachings or Christian teachings or Muslim teachings teach them. And as long as people are practicing those same teachings, even though they might think of them through Hindu, Christian, or Muslim teachings, they will still be practicing those same things that we call the five precepts. They might call them something different, but these same natural laws of existence show up in other teachings, like the five precepts. Now, the Buddha described them in a very clear way, I think clearer than any of the other traditions that I've seen. He explained the Eightfold Path in a very clear way. His teachings lead to enlightenment, where I haven't seen teachings from other teachers that do, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just means that I haven't seen them. You know, there may be Hindus I would consider to be enlightened, but they just discovered it through the path of Hindu teachings. Or there might be Muslims who we might consider to be enlightened, but they just discovered it through Prophet Muhammad's teachings. Or there might be Christians who we would consider to be enlightened, and they would say that person has the Holy Spirit. And they just kind of discovered the path through the words of Jesus Christ, but they kind of practice it and describe it in a different way, but it's essentially the same natural laws of existence just being described in a different way. Professor Gautama Buddha, for me, explained them very, very clearly, but Professor Jesus Christ or Professor Prophet Muhammad or the people who share the teachings of Hinduism or other traditions, those people might be explaining them in different ways, but it's essentially this path to enlightenment that we call the path to enlightenment in the natural laws of existence. So you might come in contact with people who have learned similar teachings through different traditions. And it doesn't mean that if they're not Buddhist, they're not going to make a good life partner. It just means that as you learn these Buddhist teachings and you look out at the world and you look to have a certain life partner, you should be looking for things along the lines that you're learning because you understand that if somebody is causing harm in the world, harm is going to come to them, which means if they're your life partner, harm is going to come to you too, potentially. So you would like to choose a life partner that are practicing good, wholesome teachings. The Buddha's teachings are one particular collection of teachings and described in a particular way. The Hindu teachings, the Christian teachings, the Muslim teachings are a, a complete unit to themselves and described in a different way. I don't know that they're as complete as what I would consider the Buddhist teachings to be complete. They have some similarities and some commonalities to Buddhist teachings. So there's things in those teachings that you can look at and you can be like, oh, wow, this person who learned the Hindu teachings are actually practicing a lot of the same exact things that we're practicing, but they're just calling it something different. And they learned it through a different set of texts, a different set of teachers. So when I say that it's wise to have a life partner that's practicing these same teachings, yes, it would be ideal if you guys were in sync and as your life partner, both of you were practicing the Buddhist teachings. That would make it really easy for you guys to have conversations and raise your children and discuss certain things about what you've got going on in life and how you make decisions that would make it so seamless and so effortless. But there are people who learn teachings from other traditions that are learning things that we would call right speech, for example, and they're learning it in their own way. And you can see those same qualities in those people. So I'm just sharing this with you so you don't think that I'm encouraging that everybody who's Buddhist has to also pick a life partner who is Buddhist as well, because that would be permanence, right? What I'm sharing is, is that as you learn these Buddhist teachings, that when you choose to make a life partner, that you look for these same qualities of things like loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity, that you look for someone who's practicing something like right view, who's accepting responsibility for their feelings and their emotions and the decisions that they're making. Look for someone who's practicing something like right intention, even though they're not calling it that, but they're practicing renunciation, they're practicing harmlessness, they're practicing non-ill will. You see them practicing right speech that even though they might not call it the five factors of well-spoken speech, you see them practicing where they're speaking at the right time, what they say is true, they're speaking gentle, they're speaking beneficially, they're speaking with a mind of loving kindness, 
you know, so forth and so on, all the way through this eightfold path, that we understand it through the eightfold path, but they might be understanding it in a different way. So be aware that there are people out there that are practicing teachings from other traditions that we might look at them and say, wow, you're actually practicing the Buddhist teachings. I just had food at an Indian restaurant on Thursday with a student here in Chiang Mai, and our waiter was just so polite and so kind and so friendly. I had a feeling that he was Hindu, but when I was looking at him, he was practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech to perfection. So I asked him, I said, are, are you practicing Hindu or are you a Buddhist? He said, actually, I'm a Hindu by birth and I, and I do practice many of the Hindu teachings, but I also really have a lot of respect for Gautama Buddha and I learn his teachings too and kind of practice his teachings as well. But this person considers themselves a Hindu, but when you look at them, it's like, wow, this person's practicing the Buddhist teachings um, because he taught the natural laws of existence. And these different traditions are all kind of tapping into those same natural laws. So you'll see Hindus, Christians, Muslims, Jainism, Judaism, and other traditions that are practicing some of these same things. Now, I don't know that any of those traditions are guiding people to eliminate discontentedness and training the mind in the way that we are, but at least on a surface level, you'll see a lot of the same qualities of mind like generosity, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity, having wholesome speech, having wholesome bodily actions and things like this as part of these other traditions. So keep that in mind as you progress in life and as you make friends and as you have life partners, that not everyone's going to be Buddhist that you associate with and they don't need to be. It would be ideal if the entire world was Buddhist because we would all be thinking in the same way and we would all have this similar way of practice, but that's not where we are in the world right now and that there are these other traditions that are teaching a lot of these same teachings and we can admire, respect, and have gratitude and appreciation for these people that are learning all the same teachings or perhaps some of the same teachings that we're learning, but they're just learning from a different perspective and a different tradition. So let me pause here and see if you guys have any remaining questions before we wrap up today's class. Seems that there are no more questions before. All right. Well, I will just end class by thanking you guys for learning today, for thanking you for taking the time, effort, energy, and resources to, to learn. Thank you all for your dedication and diligence. And I'll let you guys know that I, I love every single one of you. I have a genuine interest in seeing you all be well and seeing you all be peaceful. And I have no wants. I have no expectations from you whatsoever. I just am genuinely interested in seeing all of you be well. And this is the reason why I share these teachings with you in the way that I do, because I love you. And I love your families. I love your children. I love all your friends, all your coworkers. I love everyone in the world. And my only interest is to share teachings with those people who choose to learn. I love you just as you are. There's nothing that I want from you. There's nothing that I'm attempting to put expectations or force you to be one way or another. I'm here sharing these teachings. And as you choose to learn them, I'm here to provide you support, encouragement, and help you to grow in these teachings, loving you just as you are. So I would just like to share that with you. Next week in our Sunday class is going to be chapter 16. Here we're going to be talking about dissolving the ego. The ego serves no purpose. Here you're going to learn about the universal truth of non-self in more detail, because remember when I talked about it in chapter four, I mentioned that I was just giving you an introduction to it, and then we would be talking about it in more detail as we got into chapter 16. So we're gonna be talking about this universal truth of non-self in a lot of detail as it relates to the ego, and we're also gonna be talking about conceits or arrogance and pride, helping you to understand the problems and complications that exist in the unenlightened mind when there is a personal existence view, when there is this misperception of a permanent self in the mind, this causes the mind to struggle and have difficulties. When we have arrogance and pride, this conceit, it causes the mind to have difficulties and struggle and put strain on our relationships. So by dissolving the ego, because it serves no purpose, we can then reside more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. 
as long as there's ego in the mind, then the mind can't experience enlightenment. So that's why this shows up is chapter 16, because we need to dissolve it to get to enlightenment. And you would have needed to have a bunch of teachings under your belt before we actually start talking about dissolving the ego. This Wednesday, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation in our Wednesday meditation class. So you're invited and welcome to attend that. And I'll see you either Wednesday or Sunday. And in the meantime, just remember to continue to treat everyone polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. Don't put your expectations. Don't have wants and cravings of others to be a certain way. Instead, just have a genuine interest in seeing others be well and peaceful then you can love everyone in the world. So until next time, I'll see you then. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.